Um, I just want to take a moment and welcome some of our um, friends that are worshiping um, from home today. Uh, Pat Kasavoon, miss you. Cheryl Ramsey, uh, Lori, Lori Gildart, Ryan Stover, the Stover family, Andrea Tibbetts, Catherine LeHue, been praying for you, and uh, of course, Mary and Francis Sibley, and, and, and many others. Those are just people that kind of um, identify themselves on, on, uh, on YouTube and stuff. Um, welcome. Uh, I, have a, I have a word today that, that uh, is a word of encouragement and kind of some exhortation uh, for the church, and it's something that, that the Lord just kind of dropped in me this week. Um, we've been um, in a sermon series we started last week, and I, I entitled it Saturate because um, the word for 2021 that I feel like the Lord just put on my heart for, for, our, for our body of believers is presence. And um, you, I want to remind you, you were meant to carry the presence of God. Amen? Um, and, and, and I want to say this in that, like, in this reality, for those of you who are here or even online, like, you were meant to carry the presence of God even in a pandemic. Did you know that? I believe that 2021 um, is a year where God is wanting an increase of his presence in our midst, and, um, and I do believe it will come in an unlikely way. I don't think it's going to look like it, like it always has been. I, I truly believe that, that God is going to use that which we have looked at as a hindrance to cause great growth in the body of Christ if we let him. And, um, and because of that, I know that we need to be praying. Uh, we need to be a people of prayer. Um, one thing that the Lord has put on my heart moving forward into, into this year is that we would be a people of prayer. Jesus said in Matthew 21, my house will be called a house of prayer. And uh, we host the increase of God's presence through prayer. Amen? Um, and so I, I want to I make a call uh, out to you if you're here right now or you're watching online. Um, to all of our prayer warriors and intercessors this morning, prayer is the backbone of the church. And uh, it's one of those things like we would all nod our heads and agree to it, but, um, but not necessarily do we always um, make it at the forefront of everything that we do and as the backbone of everything that we move forward in. And I know that many of you pray, and we have, we have prayer groups, right? We have groups that, like men's morning prayer that meets here at 5.30 in the morning to be, to be praying for, for, for this church and for um, what it is that God's doing in our midst. Um, but one of the things that, I, that we're going to be launching uh, over the course of this year is an intercessory prayer team that will be praying during our services and uh, praying for our needs, for prayer requests, um, for our church, praying for our worship, that, that God's manifest presence would, would, would show up and that God's word would transform people's lives. And um, we'll be praying for our city and praying for our overseas partners all during the service. And so here's, here's what I would say. If, if that kind of leaps in you at all, like if you're just like, I, I, I know I'm supposed to be a part of that, like God's calling you to it, you're interested in it, um, whether you're in person or, or watching church from home, um, you can go to nlc.today and go to the events card. And uh, there's a little thing called intercessory prayer team. I'll just put your name, your email address, and, and let us know. We're going to have kind of an informational meeting and a little kind of a vision casting meeting on um, February 7th at 630. And I'd love for you guys to be, to be a part of that. To, if, if God's kind of leaping in you, maybe you just know that you've been called to be an intercessor, a prayer warrior. I'd love for you to join forces. As we head into this new year, we need to be bathing it in prayer. And so if, you, if that's where you're at, um, I, I would love for you to be a part of that. Again, nlc.today, go to the events card, and then uh, you can sign up. Just put your name, just to let us know that you'll be, you'll be attending, whether that's in person or, uh, or online. Um, let's pray. Lord, I, I pray that you would call all of your people to be a people of your presence and that we would be a house of prayer. And as we move forward into what it is that you're wanting to do, maybe in, in unlikely ways, Lord, we need to make sure that uh, prayer is the backbone of everything that we're moving forward into. And so, God, I pray that you would call your people, the people that you, um, that you have on your heart, that it would leap in their hearts to know that, that this is what you're calling them into. And uh, Lord, I thank you that, that they will respond. And, uh, and Lord, we just, we prod that and, and realize that there are many people in our midst that, uh, that want to be lifting your name up above any other name. And uh, we, we pray for your presence in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, thank you. So if that's, if that's, in, if that's you, then uh, make sure you sign up. Um, have you ever been, <laughs> I'm just switching gears here. Have you ever been in a situation where you get out of the shower 
and uh, you realize that you don't have a towel. It, it's, it's incredibly awkward, right? I mean, especially on, if it's not your own home. Um, that's, that's, a real, that's a real sticky situation. Um, in that moment, it can be anxiety-producing and, um, and incredibly awkward. And so in those moments when we're, when we're faced with the reality of, I didn't think before I got into the shower, um, you have a few really crucial, like a crucial decision to make. And one of, the, one of the decisions I made, this was years ago, I was on a missions trip, and um, <laughs> I got out of the shower, and, um, and I realized I didn't have a towel and um, had no way of really getting one without being very weird about it. Um, and so I chose to dry myself off with my underwear, um, the old ones. <laughs> I'm not proud of it, and, uh, and it... I'm just, it seemed logical at the time, right? I mean, you're in, you're in a foreign nation. You're already sweaty. I mean, what's the point? Yeah, you know, you've been in those places where you get out of the shower and you're already sweating. It's like, what? Yeah, I might as well just dry it off my old underwear, right? That's pretty much how I feel all day long. Let me just tell you, it is not a good way to start your day. Um, but uh, it's, it was an option that I made. Another, another decision that you could make is that you could do something known as drip drying. Um, this is where you, you shake or you spin, right? Or you twirl, whatever you got to do. Or maybe you just wait. You just wait it out, right? You ever been there? You just kind of like, you just wait it out on natural. You just dry out on natural, which means nude. And you just, you take an extra long time in the, in the bathroom, but you just kind of hope and pray that like nature will take its course and you will dry. Um, and it does. It's just kind of a long way, a long time coming, right? It'll eventually happen if you wait long enough. So the Lord was speaking to me about this, this theme that, uh, that we're calling the series, which is saturate. So I looked it up on the definition, like in Webster's Dictionary. I was like, what is the actual definition of this word? So the word means this, to hold as much water as can be absorbed. To hold as much water as can be absorbed. And, and God gave me this illustration as I was praying this week and preparing and, and this is the illustration. Um, I did it the best that I could to make it make sense, but it was this bowl of water and, and a sponge, essentially, these two things. And um, that, you know, we are the sponge and, and he is the water. And it was, this, it was kind of this reality that, like, um, the only way that we are fully saturated, which we said is to hold all that can be absorbed, is to remain immersed can't see it that well because it's black in here, but, but it's, it's, it's literally immersed completely in the water because it's fully absorbed and it's, it's fully saturated. Um, and this is, this is kind of a view of like the Christian walk that, um, that we're supposed to be in. And if we're not fully saturated, what happens? We leak, right? And sometimes it's fast. Sometimes it's a little slower but we're always in this place, if we're not fully saturated, of drip drying. It's kind of the title of my message today is, is drip drying. The, Jesus communicates this in a bunch of different ways. We see it throughout, the, throughout through Scripture, this whole idea of like, remain in me. Um, I'm the vine, you are the branches. I want you to abide, you know, that word abide. I want you to abide in me. I want you to draw near to me, remain in me. And, and, and as we come to Christ, like maybe you can remember back when you first came to Jesus, you get saturated in Christ. I mean, you can't get away from him. Like when you first get saved, man, you, you can't get him off your hand. You can't, he, everywhere you turn, there he is. His presence just bombards you. You open up your eyes in the morning and you feel his, you sense his presence. And you, you're literally, you're just kind of like saturated in, in his presence. And, um, but if we're not careful, and we're not continually immersed in him, then we eventually, we eventually draw out, dry out, like on that trail, right? And we can be wet. But we're always in this process of drip drying. And it's slow. You don't really notice it. But it is continually happening in our lives. Um, and what I want to say to you today, the, kind of the main point is, I think that many times in the church, we can confuse dampness with saturation. I'm still wet. I mean, I'm 
I'm still wet. I got, I got here, but, but, I, but if I'm not immersed in him, I'm, I'm eventually going to dry out. It may take some time. It may take longer than, than you think, but we're all, always in the process of, of drip drying. The process of drip drying is a slow fade. It's a, it's, a, it's a slow dry, and many times you don't realize that you're dry until you're bone dry, right? You just, I mean, you're just like, man, I, I didn't realize how much I, how, how, how non-saturated I, I was until all of a sudden I realized that I am, I am at the bottom of the barrel here. And as we head into this year, um, I, I truly believe that this year is going to be a year of refocusing and reclaiming that which has been lost. There's this old song, and I, I said it to some of the guys in here. Um, it was in the early 2000s. It was like a Brownsville thing. I don't know. I thought maybe New Life sang this. It was before my time here, but it was called Enemies Camp. Do you guys remember that song? It was so simple. I'll sing it to you because it's so simple. You'd know it as soon as you, it's one line we just kept singing over. That was what we did in the 2000s. You know, we just kept, we just had one line. You could write a song with one line, and you just keep singing it over. And you're like, that's why I like the hymns, right? But here's the thing. It's like, it goes, I went to the enemy's camp. And I took back what he stole from me. Come on, come on. I took back what he stole from me. Anybody? I took back. Anybody remember this? And then you'd be like, he's under my feet. He's under my feet. Satan is under my feet. Oh, man, that was, it would get me going, man. You had like the money. You'd be like, I took back what he stole. I mean, I mean, I would get into it. Like it would just like, it was like an anthem of the early 2000s of just like reclaiming that which was lost. Um, and can I just tell you that I, I just believe as we move forward, this is a time for the church to wake up, to come alive, and to take back what the devil has stolen. Um, this, I, I mean, I can't get away from that old song. I, you guys really need to look it up. It's called Enemies Camp, and just listen to it on repeat. Um, and I was, I was thinking about this, that you remember the Apostle Peter, when, when Peter first meets Jesus, He's a fisherman, and he's kind of bullheaded, kind of bold and all this, and Jesus is walking down the, the Sea of Galilee on the shore, and he sees this guy who literally does not look anything like you'd someone that you'd be like, yeah, hey, that, that guy's a leader, and Jesus is like, I want that guy to be one of my disciples. And in, in Matthew 4, 19, it, it says, Jesus looks at him and he says, come follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. And it's something that happens in that, in that asking that Peter decides to drop everything. He stops fishing for fish and he begins following Jesus. And, and for three years, he is immersed in everything Jesus. I mean, think about it. You're one of the 12 and you're one of the core. Like you're immersed. Jesus changes his life upside down. He is immersed for three years in the presence of Jesus. Can you just imagine what that must have been like? Just to... You wake up with Jesus, you go to bed, Jesus is right there. Like everything he did, Jesus turned his life upside down. Jesus gives him a new name. He used to be called Simon, and then Jesus is like, no, I'm going to call you Peter because you're a rock. I see something different in you. And he wasn't perfect. He made a lot of mistakes and kind of had a foot and mouth disease, but the dude walked on water, which is a pretty big deal. I don't know, kind of beats any of you. And, and, and then he, uh, he, he gets to see Jesus transfigured right in front of his face, and Moses and Elijah come in for the party, and he gets to watch all of this kind of like happen right in front, right in front of his face, and he's one of Jesus' core. And, and then Jesus starts getting ready to, to go to the cross. And uh, they're all sitting around at the Last Supper, also known as Supper to them, you know, because they didn't know it was the, the last supper. Why? Because we're always blinded to the history that we're living in presently, aren't we? We never really truly understand the magnitude of our current decisions until we have the opportunity to look back on them and realize, ooh, that was, a, that was kind of a big deal. You know what they say, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? <laughs> it's never going to mean the same ever again. Yikes. Um, and so they're, they're all sitting around at the Last Supper, and Da Vinci is painting them. And, um, and then Jesus looks to Peter, and he says in Luke 22, verse 31, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. In other words, you don't realize this, Peter, but, but you're at a crossroads. Like, you don't, you don't understand, but you, you're at a hinge point in history. And, and things are going to change, and they aren't going to look the way that they do right now. And here's the deal, Peter. You're not going to handle it really well. Like, you're going to screw up big time. Like, you're, you're going you're gonna to struggle spiritually. You're going to lose ground spiritually. And then, and then I love how, how Jesus, he's like, I, I, I'm just letting you know you're going to screw up. And then he says in verse 32, but I prayed for you 
that your faith may not fail. I just believe that's a word for somebody in here. Look, at you, you may, I don't know where you're at right now or what you're going through. You may be going through one of the biggest, greatest struggles of your life, but I just want you to know, I just believe that your faith may not fail. I speak that over you, that your faith may not fail. And then he says, and when you turn back, after you screw up, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your brothers. In other words, once you decide to stand up in the struggle, you're, you're going to be stronger than you are right now. I just want you to understand, it's going to be bad, it's going to be hard, and, and you're, going to, you're not going to handle this really well, and you're going to make a, some pretty boneheaded mistakes here, but once you decide to stand in the struggle, you're, it's going to be better than you are right now, and once you reclaim that which is lost, it's going to be better than it ever was. So, so Peter and Christian, don't settle. There's no pause button in the Christian life. There's no, well, I'm just going to wait till things go back to normal. Remember, listen, remember what God has called you into. Remember what he's called you out of and walk in it. No excuses. Whatever he's called you to. So what happens next? Well, Jesus uh, gets arrested and Peter denies even knowing Jesus three times to a little girl. It's kind of embarrassing, right? Jesus is tortured, he is crucified, and he dies, and his, ne- his tomb is now empty, and Peter is, is left disillusioned and sad and confused and shameful for disowning his Savior, and what does Peter decide to do? He decides to go back to his old way of life before he even knew Jesus. This is what he decides to go back to. In John 21, we watch how Peter uh, decides to go back to what he used to do before Jesus. He's, he literally says, I'm going fishing. And, he's, and a couple other guys, Andrew, a couple other guys, Jeff, it's like, I'll go with you too. In that moment, he just decides, you know what, I just, I don't necessarily know what's going on. I'm, I think I'm just going to, I think I'm just going to go fishing right now. Have you ever just wanted or been tempted to go back to what Jesus took you out of? <laughs> ever been tempted to just go backwards instead of forwards? We live in the past rather than walk into the future and say, well, you know, remember back then, if we could just go back to there, then that would be where I want to go back to. And yet Jesus never calls us to go backwards. He's always calling us to go forwards from the best it ever is to the best it ever is. If you think about it, like Peter had built his identity on, on, on following Jesus. And now that Jesus is gone, he's, he's lost ground. He's lost ground in his calling. We see it. We lost ground. He's lost ground in his security and his hope and his faith. And it's amazing how quickly the, the wheels just literally come off the bus and he's just like drip drying. It wasn't like a big, like I'm leaving and I'm never coming back and all those types of things, but he's in the process of, of drip drying. And Christian, as you head into this new year, I think it's important to take stock. What have you lost? What have you lost along the way? Have you decided to go back to what Jesus freed you from? Are you drip drying and maybe you don't even realize it? Kind of in that place of like, I don't know, I'm still damp. Isn't that good? But not like it was. And as you move forward, I I just encourage you to take stock in what you lost along the way, I think one of the most clarifying questions that anybody ever really can ask me and anyone is, how's your relationship with God? Where are you at? On a scale of like zero to 10, zero being non-existent and 10 being the best it's ever been, right? Some of you, maybe you walked in here today and you're like, "Ah, man, I thought this was Home Depot. I don't really know. I came here to do a plumbing project and this is the wrong place, and you're like, man, I, I, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. And some of you are like, man, this is the best it's ever been. God is moving and doing amazing things in my life. But many of us, we're somewhere in the middle. Where are you? I think the better question is, where do you want to be? Where do you want to be? There's this scripture that I, I don't know if I've ever necessarily had God speak to me through. It's Galatians 5, 7, and it's just one verse It's such a great question for us, for every single one of us. He says this, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you, keeping you from obeying the truth? Who cut in on you? 
How would you answer that question in Galatians 5, 7? Who cut, on, who cut in on you? Who tried to take you out of the race? Who cuts in on you and tries to, tries to trip you up or cause you to drip dry and confuse dampness with saturation? Who cut in on you? And there's like a bunch of different reasons, right? I mean, we're all sitting here. We've got different things that are going on in our own life. I, I wrote down four things uh, this week because I, I just feel like there's, there's, a, there's a few different things that, that, that could be going on. The first one is this. One thing that causes us to drip die, the things that we've done, right? Decisions that we make, things that we, we do or that we, that we don't do. And here's the reality. Isolation this year, this past year has not helped us out very well in that, in that, that, that area of life, right? Because we all have this propensity for selfishness, and we get caught up in the things of this world rather than take our eyes off of Jesus, or we get caught up in the needs of self rather than keeping our eyes on Christ. 1 Peter 2.25, Peter writes this, For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of, our, of your souls. Honestly, if anyone could write this, I think Peter, Peter understands. Why? Because he's like, I lost three years in one day and went back to the place where Jesus told me to leave. If anybody understands what it's like to, to feel like you're kind of going backwards, it's Peter. Here's the good news, and here's the good news for each and every single one of us. Jesus is the good shepherd who goes, leaves the 99 and goes after the one who has wandered away. So even if you've wandered away, it really doesn't matter how far and how dry, how bone dry you feel, or how, how distant you are from God right now, or the things that you've done. I want you to know that he's still seeking after you. He's still seeking after you. So for, for, for that's one. One is the, the things that, that we've done. And then the second one is the things that other people have done to us. <laughs> Many times people will, will cut in on you and hinder your relationship with God. You know, what, you know who they are, right? You know what they've done. They, they, they never, and they should have, but they didn't, and they could have, but they wouldn't. They never, and, and they always, and many times we allow them to stop our movement in our relationship with God as if it's like, as if they have the power to be able to hinder your relationship with God. I love how, how uh, Joseph, in Genesis chapter 50, addresses his brothers who had sold him into slavery. He says this, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Let me remind you, Christian, here today, as we're coming out, as we're, as we're moving in, in this hinge point of history, like, don't let their failures keep you from his freedom. Because they don't have the power or the authority to take away your relationship from, from God. So walk in it. Walk in it, walk in it, walk in it. The third one is this, that um, this would be um, circumstances beyond our control. 2020, 2020, right? Circumstances that, that, that we don't necessarily have control over. We wish we did, but we don't, but we can't. And so it's absolutely maddening. John 16, says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. In other words, don't let the storms or the wind or the waves or the chaos or the pressures or the fears or the frustrations take you away from me. Allow them to drive you deeper into me. Drive deeper into God. In other words, maybe we stand up and say, I am not allowing a pandemic to drip dry me. I am not allowing political turmoil to drip dry me. My relationship with God is my relationship with God, and no matter what wind or waves are around, I am not allowing circumstances that are outside of my control to ever get in the way of my relationship with God. It's a big one. And then there's this fourth one that I, that I just feel like I've, I've just, in, in talking with people and in and, and talking about the things that we're going through as, as, a, as a people, and I think that it's disappointment with God. Disappointment with God. Feeling like, man, he should have done this or this should have happened, but it didn't. Um, there, there, there are some of us who are listening that have really lost ground in our relationship with God because we're disappointed in him. And we wouldn't say it out loud. It's not something you'd be like, yep, I'm disappointed in God. 
right? It's this, it's this thing, this nagging sense that like God should have done something that he didn't and I'm disappointed in him. Really, disappointment is just unmet expectations. So there's like our expectations minus our current reality equals our level of disappointment. And so we get to the point where it's like, man, I just was thinking that God was going to do something different. We t- I preached a couple weeks ago about John the Baptist in prison, and he's wondering why in the world is Jesus not getting me out? Me thinking, Jesus, we're cousins. Don't make me talk to my mom. And, and I gave my life up for you. Why in the world are you not doing anything? Am I, are you the one? He asked this question. Are you the one or should I be waiting for somebody else? And then Jesus sends this word back by, by way of John's disciples. And, and this is the word. He literally he says this kind of odd phrase. He said, Matthew eleven sixteen or 6, excuse me. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. In other words, like, Blessed is the person who does not walk away from relationship with me because I do not do for him what they think I should do for them. Who cut in on you? Who cut in on you and and kept you from obeying the truth? And here's the thing, as we talk about it, like, right, whether it's things that you've done, things other people have done, circumstances outside of your control, uh, you know, uh, disappointment with God, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter at the end of the day what, 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 what thing cut in on you and kept you or, or stole from you. What matters is what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? Because we're supposed to go from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from the best it's ever been to the best it's ever been. And one of my greatest fears I would say even especially right now in the place where the church is at and the, the, the tenor of, of, our, of the church nationwide is that we would become professional Christians. Not necessarily growing deeper, but just growing older. Saying the right things, trying to do the right things, but not really producing fruit, just producing camouflage with leaves. And I just want to remind you that as we move forward, as we, as we want to be a, a people of his presence, that God has not called you to, be, uh, to live a leafy life. He's called you to be fruitful from the best it's ever been to the best it's ever been. Matthew 15, 8, Jesus warns us and he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts, their hearts are far from me. Jesus doesn't really care so much about the things that are going on the outside. He really, it's always and always has been about the heart. Always about the heart. And our behaviors will always catch up with our hearts. And you can go through seasons where you try to like mask it and hide it and act like everything's fine and all these things are good and nothing's wrong and all of these things, but the reality is is that our behaviors will eventually catch up with our hearts. So Peter goes back fishing, and um, he's not catching anything. You can read it for yourself. Like he, <laughs> the Bible says he's literally holding on to an empty net, which is, for a fisherman, just a really bum, bum day, right? And he's, he's not catching anything. Why? Because whenever we go back to the things that God has invited us to leave, it is always fruitless. That'll preach. Um, whenever we go back to the things that, we think we should go back to and God called us out of, we'll never find the blessing that we're hoping we get. And this is where Peter's at. He's like, well, I'm just going to go back to fishing, but he's not going to catch any fish. Why? Because God, God told him to not fish for fish. He says, I want you to fish for people. And then all of a sudden, in this story, Jesus is walking on the sea, uh, on the, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. It is very reminiscent of the first time they met. Peter's out there fishing or trying to fish, and there's Jesus, and, and uh, almost like the same situation. And I love this because even when we're trying to hide, even when we're trying to walk away, even when we're drip drying, he is so good at really finding lost things. He is so good at coming and saying, I, I actually never called you to that. I'm calling you back. And he calls out to them, and he's like, hey, did you guys catch any fish? And they're like, No. That's because I told you not to fish for fish anymore. But anyway, throw it on the other side of the boat and you'll catch some. So they're like, 
Go on the other side. Sure enough, they catch so many fish that it's more than they can actually handle. The nets are about to break, and they finally muscle them to shore, and they finally get there, and Jesus is there hanging out, and he cooks them breakfast. I mean, how amazing is that to have like a fresh breakfast on the, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee with Jesus cooking it, right? And then in John 21, verse 15, it says, When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, son of John, um, do you love me more than these? And it always drives me nuts that, that for some reason here, Jesus calls Peter Simon. Because that's his old name. Why does he call him Simon? Like, Jesus actually said, you were, not, you were once called Simon, I'm calling you Peter because you are the rock. Why? Because whenever we come to Jesus, our identity changes. And so we find in this weird scenario of cooking breakfast on a beach, Jesus is calling Peter Simon again. It's almost like he's saying, hey, Peter, remember when we first met? Remember how it was my grace that reclaimed your life in that one moment? Remember that? Well, Peter, it's the same grace that will reclaim your life in this moment. And it really doesn't matter where you've gone or how drip dry you are, if you're bone dry or still damp, I just want you to know. And then he asks Peter this really central question, which I think is at the heartbeat of, of a question for every single one of us, is this. He says, do you love me? And he asks him three times. You still love me? Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me after what you did? You denied knowing me? you still love me? Do you love me after what others did to me and to you? Do you still love me? Do you love me when you went through that circumstance that was outside of your control? Do you still love me? Do you love me even though I disappointed you and I, I, I didn't turn out to be the Savior that you thought I was going to be? And do, do you still love me? Three times. Revelations chapter 2, verse 4. The Spirit of Jesus is writing to these these churches, and he says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. <laughs> it's kind of a big deal. Sounds big. It's this reality that no matter how far you feel, no matter how drip dried you are, he, he, he's like, I want you to go back to the love that you had at first. I want you to come back to me and I really don't care what you've been through or what you've done or what other people did to you or the circumstances that you've been through. I want you to be immersed in me, to be saturated in me and it really doesn't matter where you're at or what you've done. Just come back to the love that you had at first. And he, and he, and he follows up in verse 5. He says, consider how far you've fallen. Consider it. Take stock in it. He says, repent and do the things you did at first. Repentance. This idea of just like, God, I, I'm not where I should be, and, and I want to be back with you, and so I'm choosing this day to turn from my wicked ways and to get back into your presence and to be saturated in you. Can I just tell you, repentance is not a bad word. It is one of the most beautiful gifts to us as Christians. It's actually the entranceway to the pathway of freedom in our life. And if we choose to repent, it's not a, well, I'm admitting that I'm wrong. I don't like that. I'm admitting I'm having to say sorry. It is so much more than that. It's choosing to walk in a different way and to say, God, I, I've tried it my own way and I am bone dry and I desperately need your presence and I'm sorry for what I've done and I want to walk in obedience to you. Who cut in on you? and caused you from keeping the faith, the truth. Who cut in on you? And then he says, like, once, he says three times, yes, Lord, I love you. Of course, I love you. I told you, I love you. And once you can say that, Jesus says to Peter, he says, feed my sheep. 
you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, you, you, you keep asking me this. You know that I love you. Can I just encourage you? What, whatever it is that God has called you to, walk in it. Walk it out. You need, to, you need to feed the sheep. You need to get involved in other people's lives. Find a project. Start a life group. Invite somebody over to your home. Find a Timothy that you can mentor. Because fullness is not measured by what we contain. Fullness is measured by what overflows. And as we pour out that which God has done in our life and stay saturated, we begin to spray out and pour that love onto other people. And he's like, feed my sheep. If you love me, then walk it out. Feed my sheep. And the last thing he says is, follow me. In other words, he's like, meet with me. Uh, Let me lead you again. Spend time with me. Listen to me. Let me lead you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, he says, And the grace and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That's good news for 2021, let me just tell you. Like, what, what if the goal, let me just blow something up here. What if the goal was not to get back to normal? What, what, if, what, if, what if normal um, is actually a false ceiling? What if, what if normal really wasn't working all that well to begin with? And that what if we're called to go from glory to glory, from the best it's ever been to the best it's ever been? Never meant to go backwards. We're meant to go forwards. So my question to you this morning, as you've been, ta- as you've been li- listening to this message, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Like, what have you, what have you lost along the way? What is it that God's saying, I, I-, I want you to reclaim this? Maybe it's your joy. Maybe, maybe what you've lost is your simple, childlike, all-in, sell-the-farm, childlike faith. Maybe it's your purity. Maybe it's your sobriety. Maybe it's your trust that God is truly your provider. Or maybe it's your passion for God's word or for God's people. Whatever that thing is, I just want you to take stock in the thing that you've lost along the way. Um, are, you, are you drip dry and, and not really realizing it? Have you come to the place where you're like, you know what, I kind of realize. But I'm trying so hard to pretend that everything's fine. Because the enemy came to steal, kill, and to destroy. And Jesus says, it's time to reclaim it. Amen? Amen. And how do you do that? You saturate in him. <laughs> well, I, I know, but it's got to be more than that. Um, no. It's actually really simple. We just choose this day to come back to the place of God. I, I need your presence more than anything in my life right now. I need your presence more than anything in my life right now. And I guarantee you, <laughs> all the rest of the things will take care of themselves. And so I want to challenge you to come back to your first love. The good news is that it doesn't matter how dry you are, that he's literally calling you to, to be restored. No matter how far you've strayed, you are meant to carry the presence of God and you are, you are meant to be filled to to all that you can hold. And so if you're here right now, this is what I want to encourage you in right now. Um, If you're in that place right now, maybe you've been listening, maybe you're here right now, or you're even online right now, um, I just want to encourage you, if this is where you're at and you feel like the Holy Spirit is leaping in you, I I want you to stand to your feet. Right now, stand right to your feet. You feel like you've lost something over this year. Look, it could be something simple. It could be something that God's just like highlighting to you that you used to do, but, you, but you, God's calling you back to. I just want you to recognize it just by standing up and saying, God, I'm hearing your voice right now. And I want today to be a day where I reclaim it. And maybe you just decide, like, and I want to say this, even if you're watching church at home, you stand up wherever you're at, I want to challenge you to do that. And maybe you just put your hands out, palms up in a place of just receiving today. I want to challenge you, wherever you're at, put your hands out as if you're receiving something. I just want to pray over you. If you're in that place right now, Lord Jesus, I know that, that we've lost something along the way. And I'm taking it back today. 
And maybe you say that right now, Lord, I'm taking it back today. I'm not waiting for the circumstances to change. I'm not allowing them to to dictate my relationship with you. I'm not waiting for normal. I'm moving from glory to glory, from the best it's ever been to the best it's ever been. And I know, Lord, that I am meant to be saturated in your presence. And so, Lord, I just, I just ask for your presence to be here right now in our midst. I pray that for each and every single one of us, no matter how dry we feel, that we sense his presence saturating us today. That we are called to be filled and continually being filled in your presence. We are called to carry the presence of God wherever we go. We're not called to drip dry and we're not called to, to, to be damp and think that it's saturated. So Jesus, I pray for boldness in the lives of our people. I pray that we would go into the enemy's camp and take back what he stole over this past year along the way. And this day, as as we stand before you, reclaiming what has been taken, Jesus, we walk forward into all that you have for us. I pray that this year would be the best it's ever been. That we wouldn't be looking back to what it used to be, but that we walk forward into what it could be and what it is that you're wanting. And so as we steward your presence, as we host your presence, both individually and corporately, I pray that you would make way for the best it's ever been that our best years are in front of us, not behind us. And Jesus, I thank you for your presence because we don't want to go any other way. We need a fresh and filling of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, I pray for every person that's willing and, 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 and wanting, I pray a fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit right now over every single one of us. Lord, I pray even in the, the, the sound of my voice of worshiping at home, Lord, sitting on a couch, Lord, I pray for a fresh infilling of your presence right now so that we can walk in all that we have before us for this year. I thank you that you continually want us to be saturated in you. We lift you up today, God. We lift you up, we lift you up, we lift you up. Fill us to overflowing, to saturation. We love you, we love you, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Lord, thank you, Lord. Have an amazing week. I pray that you take what God has done in here and walk it out. Amen? Amen. God bless you.